So first of all, thank you all for coming out. Um, really excited to be doing this. Um, we are Reflections Data. We're a digital strategy and development firm. Uh, we just opened this office uh, about six weeks ago. So um, this is our first event in the space. So um, thank you for, for coming out. So um, one of the reasons we chose this space is because uh, this really is the epicenter of, of uh, I think, what's happening in, in digital in many respects. Um, and in front of you, you have many of uh, the creators of that future. Um, I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, and uh, first I want to start with a quote from William Gibson, which is that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to introduce our panel. And uh, our panel, uh, which is kind enough to, to donate their time tonight, uh, is an all-star cast of some of the top digital agencies uh, in New York, and in fact, uh, in some cases, global agencies, and um, we're honored to have them here tonight. So uh, in front of me, we have Paul Sundu. Um, he's the uh, Director of Digital Strategy and Production at DDB New York. And uh, so thank you, Paul. We have Richard uh, Scatsberger, the Chief Technology Experience Officer from Co Collective. Um, we have Michael Ogins uh, from, uh, he's, uh, from Big Fuel, the Director um, of Platform and Product Strategy. Uh, Ryan Kitson, uh, Art Director from Flight Path. And uh, Damon Krapenberg, the Chief Creative Officer of Full Six. So. That's our panel. Thank you. So, I want to start off with just um, just going to set the stage here with with kind of a my own feeling on, on how the internet has changed in the last you know five or, or ten years, which is that the internet used to be for me, uh, in my mind, it was basically a network that connected racks of servers with desktop computers. That was basically how I thought of the internet, and and it's basically evolved from that to now a network of virtual and cloud servers, uh, certainly still serving desktops, but predominantly serving mobile handsets. And so that's a really interesting evolution. And it almost seems like, um, you know, that the desktop paradigm is kind of the first stage of the internet, and it kind of shed that skin, and now it's sort of emerging as sort of the next iteration of, of what the internet is. Um, so I want to start off with some questions um, and uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with Paul, and then we can take it from there. Um, and actually, maybe each of you can kind of answer this question for me. Maybe just give a, a brief introduction of, of uh, uh, what you do, and then your vision of mobile and mobile marketing for the next five to ten years. So, five to ten, yeah. <laughs> Radio. Hi, I'm Paul. It's nice to meet everybody. I think there was an operational uh, Oh. You, you, you meant, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah just <laughs> sorry. into the microphone. Like, leave way up. Yeah. Like that? How are we, how are we doing? Yeah. There we go. Okay, yeah. good to see. I, I think you meant to see us from least to most beardy. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get up and move? <laughs> I, I, I work at DDB. I, 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 uh, big old school brick and mortar agency. We've been around for 40 years, you know. Uh, Fernbach, all that mad men stuff. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, we do uh, more digital at DDB than we do uh, print and broadcast combined every year. So we're growing like uh, gangbusters. And my job is basically to, we use a lot of pixels at DDB, and I, I sweep up the pixels when they fall over the place. Um, in, in terms of uh, vision for, for mobile technology, is that a mobile marketing? Yeah, what's the future of mobile marketing in yeah. the next 10 years? That's right. the question. In the small country. Uh, we barely scratch the surface. I mean, the, the, from, from my perspective, uh, the, the huge uh, generational leap with mobile technology to the point you made is uh, not necessarily about uh, cloud storage. It's about uh, cloud CPU, right? So all these wonderful services that are just sort of beginning to glimmer to light, like uh, Siri or Google Translate, uh, we get excited about them. And, and the, the jury may still be out on some of those. But the real uh, sort of edge those have on everything we've seen before is they're doing all of the processing in the cloud. And we're, we're at like the one sort of yard line. We're just starting our huge uh, sojourn across the field. 
and, and where will it end up? We've got no idea. So my answer is, I've got no idea. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> the, ex the experts have spoken. <laughs> so, and with that, Richard, brief introduction and what's your vision? Great. Um, so I'm Richard. Uh, and speak into the microphone. Here we go. How's that? Uh, Richard, Chief Technology Experience Officer at Co Collective. We are a growth accelerator. Um, we help invent and reinvent brands, businesses, and products um, through a collective model of amazing specialist experts. Um, so, the future of mobile marketing, I think, is, good, is again, there's no kind of answer for it because we're making it up as we go along, and that's the most exciting thing about being in this space. Um, it's about experimentation, trying new things, using technology in bizarre and interesting ways, and the connection. I think we've got something really, really magical where we used to think about um, the space and the screen and the things that we put on there. And with mobile, it's really about the human beings behind it. So I think it's less about kind of mobile marketing, more about kind of how do we enable new things and new value in human beings' lives. And I think there's a way to kind of start rethinking about how marketing and marketers think of their brands. And it's really about them providing APIs into the value that they have inside their corporation. Um, and we have amazing other companies out there, the startups, the Flipboards, the Foursquares out there, and give those companies access to the value and the data and the information and the products and services, and swap it out from being kind of brands being uh, front and center and trying to own the screens, to let the services that people want to use access amazing pieces of value to make Okay, thank you. So, uh, my name is McCall Hoggins. I, um, I'm at Big Fuel, which is the world's largest uh, social media agency. We're a pure play agency. The company split up into eight or nine different teams, ranging from, from, from paid firms and firms media, social, as well as a studio team. I lead all of our emerging social technology, as well as um, we're in the process of building our own social media operating system, and I'm leading the product development on that. Um, it's very interesting. One of the major things I do at Bigfield is, is meeting startups as well as established companies. I've met with more than 350 companies in the past year, everything from social commerce, social gaming, listening platforms, social media management systems. Um, and have got really an awesome insight into, or tried to get an insight into, into the trends that we see in, in the digital and startup space. So I think that I have a theory about, about technology, both software and hardware, and I think that really engineers are trying to humanize software and, tech, and hardware, so it mimics the many layers of human behavior. And I think that's why social media has taken off, and that's why it's going to continue to take off. Today, 60 to 70 percent of data is consumed on a mobile device is social. So I think that the future, I think, this needle is going to continue to move in a positive direction. And I think the future of mobile marketing in uh, in a mobile device will be social. Will be social. Okay, great. Now, there's clearly an intersection between social and mobile, and those two can often be sort of interchangeable. So, um, that's great. Thank you. So Ryan. Um, my name is Ryan Kitson, I'm our director at an agency called Flight Path, a um, digital marketing agency down um, just down the street on 25th Street, actually. Um, pretty small staff, 30 people. Um, we do everything from uh, social, we have, um, let's see, we're any clients, pharma, um, products, but the, the general, general thing. Um, I agree with Paul. I, I don't know why. I shouldn't um, be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to be on the creative, uh, the creative side, but in terms of uh, you know technology, uh, I grew up in a techno file environment. Um, my dad was a head of uh, R&D for Packard, so I got all the cool gadgets that came in, um, and uh, you know it's it's going to be going to be very interesting. I think for me, I'm going to talk about my personal wishes. Um, I'm tired of having two marks on my pants. I don't know if you guys can tell. I have an iPhone mark, and I have a log mark, and I'd love to get rid of this one over here. Um, mobile payments, I think, is going to be cool. Uh, whatever, NFC, RFID, um, I, I think uh, that would be a short term uh, wish that I would have in the near future. Um, yeah, I, I, there's just so many things coming together with um, you know, different data channels and just layers of information that. Uh, uh, 
you know, how we're going to visualize that and create uh, you know, UI systems to, uh, to take it. Definitely a user experience. Definitely user experience challenge. And uh, can you guys hear in the back? No. no? Okay. <laughs> there are lots of seats at the front. Yeah, there are some seats at the front if you guys want to move up. But um, I would just encourage us to speak up. So, uh, so with that, uh, I'll just David at the end. Good evening in the back. <laughs> so first, I want to get something out of the way. I met a bet with uh, people from my agency that I would say hippopotamus. So hippopotamus, hippopotamus, hippopotamus. So this is probably three or four beer for me. <laughs> Um, I think the the future of um, I think the question is wrong, and <laughs> even <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's true. And uh, and uh, I think even this kind of meeting is dangerous because I remember being in meeting like that like 10 to 15 years ago, which was the future of the web, right? And um, what we've learned from moving from the broadcasted era with you know billboard and TV to the web, and what we still experience today, moving on to new technology, mobile, and the future probably be like cyborg, you know, mix of machine and human. We don't laugh; it's true. I know only one guy in this room that doesn't have a cell phone on himself. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think. We all we, we are all already like with a half electronic brand and a half regular brand. But coming back to my comment, I think this this question is wrong because what matters is not the mobile. Like what matters is not the web, which is pretty much dying right now. What matters is what we do in it. And when you ask people, people from you know our client as an agency or even the end user, like you know what do you what do you think, what do you do on mobile, they don't give a shit. They don't care. They just do things with their friend or they do things with a brand, and they don't think if it's on mobile or not. So the key question is. When is mobile to die? I'm pretty sure it's pretty soon, according to all the research at the MIT and you know body integration and disparation evaporation of the interface. You mean it's mobile? Oh yeah, I, I think it's already dying. I think uh, I. And what's taking its place? I'm sorry. And what's taking its place? I'm sure. I, th I think if you look, remember the question is five to ten years down the road. Um, I think. We have been experiencing more and more usage of application. This application imply interface that are really, you know, annoying. They take time. They take uh, a lot of energy. They take, you know, they are not very fluid. And we are about to experience a phase where all those data that we access through mobile interface, whatever it's an iPad, a touchscreen on the fridge, or my GPS in my car, will be connected directly within my body. So we will experience over the next five to ten years the yes, integration. Exactly, yeah. So we will be experiencing the integration of data directly inside my body. I can name twenty different. I'm not. I'm speaking too much, but anyway. So yeah, that, I think that's what's going to happen. Let's leave. Okay. Leave it to the French guy to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're on this panel, David. I knew you. You'd introduce some controversy. Um, so that sounds like a pretty intense cyborg-like future that you've just painted for us. Um, so I guess you know that that brings me to another subject that I wanted to touch on, which is you know the mobile phone is it's almost like it's getting closer to our bodies, right? Like we have the desktop. Uh, now we have the mobile phone, and, and you're alluding to what seems like a natural progression towards maybe embedded whatever. And we've seen new devices. I mean, hardware, it seems like, is really the catalyst for, for revolutions in the space of digital, like the smartphone was. Um, and, you know, we're seeing devices like Google Goggles, and we're seeing, oh, is it Glasses? Yeah, Goggles is the image recognition. Oh, okay. Google Glasses. And um, I wonder if, because, call me crazy, but I would feel ridiculous wearing Google Glasses. And would anyone in this room actually wear these things on the street? No. It's like five hands, and it's all the French people, okay? So, <laughs> so I, my last year of study, I've been standing in the room, and, and one guy came, like we came to you today, and speak in front of the whole you know, promotion and says, you know, down 10 to 15 years, you guys will have a mobile phone. 
by the time it was like big like that, right? And whenever you guys go down sixth flight with stairs, like walk up flight, you will back up and go and get it if you forget it. And everyone in the room was laughing and saying, yeah, right. You know, like you, you guys are laughing with the Google Glass yesterday. Fact is, I will totally walk six flight up to get my cell phone in the morning. And, and this happened over like, what, five, seven years? And we, we all had that. And um, some people, I forget who, like had uh, this, uh, this amazing slide where you had like a key, a wallet, a flashlight, a cell phone, a, a credit card, and all of that was disappearing for only the cell phone, which actually make a flashlight if you have the right time. <laughs> So anyway, so I think, yeah, I think we, we shouldn't laugh. We should really look forward. If we are serious about doing marketing, marketing being about a relationship with what people expect, we shouldn't laughing. We should be hardcore working a new interface on a fridge on a, which, which, which suppresses the mobile to give more freedom and a more relevant and smart interaction. And everything's cracking in you know, version one. This is primordial version one. It hasn't been beta yet. We can only imagine what it'll be in five or ten years, to your point earlier. Right. I, I think it's an interesting point. It, mobile, I think, is often associated with smartphones. That's what people think of as mobile. But mobile is, is you know, so much more than that. And um, it seems like now tablets are, are sort of mobile. And I think people struggle with the idea of whether the tablet is in, in that umbrella term. And we've seen things like the Pebble Watch. Uh, is this a Kickstarter thing, Greg? That, yes. Yeah, this is the Kickstarter that, that raised, what, like a uh, couple million dollars, right? It's completely sold out. So this is clearly another mobile device. It just happens to be a wristwatch. So. I think the thing is, though, is, I think the thing is, it's not about the device. It's the mobile. I think it's about the fact that people are mobile. And we, have, we kind of focus in on the object and the device itself. So right now, we're focusing on cell phones with a screen that's a certain resolution. Google Glass is focusing on kind of a, another type of screen. I think when we think about human beings being the mobile thing, it's the things that you carry around and you sit in front of. I still think the TV is part of the mobile ecosystem. The fact that I'm sitting in front of it and actually move over to the sofa, that's a part of my mobility of my day. Uh, and I think when we get away from thinking about kind of the individual devices and the features and software specs and what you can do on each individual device and start looking about the connections between those devices, then magic happens. Google Goggles is not going to, or Google Glass is not going to be a replacement for the cell phone. It will be an augmentation to life. And how we distribute different pieces of data, different pieces of functionality across those different things appropriately, that's what will make kind of a, a richly data connected, interactive life for people that can actually start to get what I like to think about as superpowers. So how does technology give human beings superpowers? And Google Glass will do that. My TV does it. It, few, it, feels, it kind of fuels the amount of knowledge and um, content in there. My alarm clock is part of that. My cell phone is giving me um, superpowers. Things like paper, um, wonderful little app on the iPad if you haven't downloaded it. It makes me a better drawer. Um, Instagram, whether you agree with it or not, makes me a better photographer. So how we start to kind of stop thinking about mobile as individual devices and arguing whether it's a tablet or a phone and start thinking about the mobility of human beings and focus on those kind of routes through life, I think we'll get to a much better place. Once my web browser on my TV is a little bit better, I'll totally or you don't use a web browser on a TV because we're just trying to force the wrong type of interaction and wrong type of modality into the wrong type of device because that's not where I want to interact with that type of content. Let's put that somewhere else in the right place at the right time. Kind of think about it as surround screens rather than surround sound. And we get to this interesting thing where the right sound, the bullets flying behind me are coming out of these and the dialogue's coming over there. That's an interesting way to think about data, content, and interactivity. We have we have a heckler in the front row. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, we, you guys are all in the business of of, um, of working for, for, for big uh, brands. Some of the biggest brands in the world are represented by the people in front of you. We are in the business of working for the clients of those big brands. Okay, working for the clients of those big brands. Um, I stand corrected. Uh, help me understand this from the perspective of the brand. Um, I think there's a, a lot of brand managers that are struggling with the question of how to capitalize on the 
uh, evolving behaviors of consumers. Um, you know, we, we've seen some, what, what I would characterize as sort of awkward first steps towards things like check-ins that would unlock coupons. Okay, it's a nifty idea. Doesn't seem like it's uh, gone mainstream. Um, and it seems like platforms like Foursquare um, might even be leveling off in terms of their level of adoption and usage. So what is a brand manager to do um, in trying to capitalize on uh, this ecosystem? And I'll, I'll leave it open to anyone who, who cares to speak to it. So I think that as a brand manager, either on the agency side or on the client side, when you're, when you're devising and ideating a social, oh, sorry, any digital, social, or any marketing strategy, even if it's on site, usually just about every single campaign will leverage a technology, right? Whether it's hardware or software. And I find that one of the most important things is to marry the software or the hardware, the technology, to what the brand is trying to achieve. So, you know, there's, there's either KPIs and analytics that you're going to be measuring on the success of that campaign, and or, or usually both, business goals that the brand is trying to achieve, right? Whether it's increasing sales and increasing sentiment and increasing um, perhaps it's social fan growth or whatever it is. So, and the technology has to be married upstream early on in a campaign in order to achieve those, those results. And I think that when you start to look at um, technology in a very microscopic manner and look at, um, in this case, minuscule product features and, 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 and hardware devices, you can really uh, make sure that the technology is married correctly to, to the goals of the campaign. I kind of disagree on the fact that the technology should, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and that's my second one. But, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm, you know, I'm still wondering if technology should be married at the very beginning of the brief, because that drives side of thinking. I think today you have, if you look at the big picture, you have medias, you know, and mobile and tablet is one of them, and you have offline and you have broadcast, and you have, and you have data, data stream coming up and down across this media. And the core of what we develop for our end user and our clients and what, you know, what actually perform in terms of ROI are the campaigns that are mainly think about what is my brand mission? What are the relevant data that I should send to my client? What are the relevant data that I should listen from my client in order to be better at delivering an outstanding service and surprising? And after, down the road, we need to choose, and very often, actually, it's the end user choosing if you will access this by Twitter, or by an API, or by a Facebook app, or whatever. And, and this, ultimately, is just an executional thing. I don't think that by bringing the technology too, too you know, early in the thinking process when you do brand planning, you do good for end technology. Uh, ultimately, it's a business problem, right? The brand manager wants to uh, spread the good word about their product or their service as uh, you know widely as possible and as efficiently as possible, reach the maximum number of people. And they can do that using a variety of media types. And any good manager should know that, like, like a mutual fund, it, it should be a, a rounded mix, right? They, they've got some traditional media they're using, some uh, newspaper advertising, some television. And then in the case of the sort of more innovative stuff, mobile technology, boy, you know what? It's it's not there aren't any success stories or as many success stories right now. Foursquare doesn't have that bullseye target where everybody's like, oh, uh, yo-yos are back, and it's thanks to Foursquare. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost my turn of thought. I was fantasizing about <laughs> walking the dog. In any case, brand managers should spend a slice of their time and their budgets working on that every quarter, every year, and, and trying to innovate. And, and testing and learning, admitting their failures, and then trying again. Right? That's what it's all about. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a scam>. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be so jealous when we hug later. <laughs> Uh, 
So I'm going to open it up to questions uh, to, in the audience in just just a moment. Um, so think about your question. Um, but before I do that, I want to shift gears and talk about something that is um, going to be in all the headlines tomorrow, which is Facebook. And I want to get your opinion on how Facebook uh, is dealing with the issue of mobile. Because it seems like Facebook's Achilles heel. And, um, and, and, and I don't think I'm the only one who, who thinks that. So um, if anyone has an opinion, I'd, I'd love to hear it. W is this going to be the downfall of Facebook? Um, and what is Facebook going to look like in the next decade? Is Facebook going to be around in 10 years? How is Facebook going to deal with, with the mobile problem? Brian, do you have, do you have uh, you're, you're looking particularly insightful at the moment. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think they're going to do a lot of purchasing. Um, just buy up their competition. They got a lot of cash. I'm being kind of facetious here. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a big, big question. Um, <clears throat> I personally like the mobile experience right now because I don't have to deal with advertisements. Um, so I think they're doing that correctly. In terms of monetizing, um, you know, they have a lot of user data if they, if they patch it in with like location deals and, um, you know, payment options. Um, it could be an interesting platform because they, they do have that user data, um, which is kind of unique. Um, it's like Visa meets Facebook, for instance. Uh, that could be kind of an interesting, uh, interesting experience. Um, I just want to do a quick survey. Raise your hand if Facebook is checking your Facebook feed is the first thing you do in the morning on your mobile. <laughs> Okay, the second thing you are doing? How many people check their Facebook feed on their mobile while they were here, arriving at this conference? Oh. How many of you are on Facebook, actually? <laughs> you know, my, my point is, but obviously I'm wrong, looking at the audience, but um, I don't think Facebook is doing bad in mobile at all. Like, I think for the growth they were experiencing, they had a lot of problems fixing their, you know, their internal structure in order to, you know, to, uh, to have a, a growth on every platform, not only mobile. The mobile apps is pretty decent. I would totally love to have a mobile app like that. And uh, you know, I don't know why. It's a question to you. Like, why do you say they do wrong on mobile? Because of the monetization, right? So, can I? So I, I spoke to Mark last week at Facebook. Cool. And um, no, seriously, Big Fuel has a pretty strong relationship with Facebook. But I think, from a marketing perspective, Facebook. I think he was in my bathroom. What? <laughs> He was on the phone, it was so rude. He was, he was talking to you. I think from, from a marketing perspective, Facebook has completely failed. Uh, we face this challenge on a, every single campaign. Um, the technology that we deploy inside of Facebook tab does not work in the mobile experience. Um, there are some third party layers that you can layer into there. Um, <clears throat> That's because you do campaign on Facebook and Facebook is everything but doing campaign. But, one second, so, I think that, that Facebook is smart um, with the IPO, they're going to have to monetize in, mo in mobile. I think uh, they have a lot under their sleeve that's going to come out, including um, mobile ads within the Facebook environment, but they're most likely going to come from a brand channel manager, not um, not like a blasted um, banner on the side, like it is in the web, web environment. Um, and, you know, I think what working with so many social media management platforms, they themselves are already changing their roadmaps to make sure that their platforms will run in the mobile space because people who are running the brand, channel, brand channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, eventually Pinterest, it's all going to be done from a mobile device primarily. And that means that ads are going to be pushed out into, through these systems into the mobile space and Facebook's not going to have a choice. They're going to have to, the consumer's going to be living on Facebook only in a mobile experience. Mobile defined as TV or, or tablet or, or, or mobile smartphone. And Facebook is going to have to monetize there because the, the opportunity to monetize in the web space is going to decrease, which means that there's going to be a lot more opportunity for marketers. 
I'll disagree with David too. We'll, and then we can have it out afterwards. Uh, the, for advertisers, the uh, Facebook mobile experience is inadequate right now. Uh, we do a, a huge number of uh, Facebook campaigns, and the sort of central hub of them tends to be a, a custom tab. And Facebook encourages this. They they love working with you to come up with what that tab experience should be like. And uh, you, you're disagreeing, but they, they do, and they sell you media to drive there, and they make lots of money, and then it all works out for everybody theoretically. And right now, the mobile experience doesn't support tabs at all. So we create this wonderful desktop experience, and, and some are more effective than others, and we all you know, work hard on them. But when you click through, and you click through the shares and the wall posts, when you're on a mobile device, you, you get to nothing. They just dead end. And until they do something about that, you know, and I'm sure they will. Very, very smart people are working on it. But there's nothing there now. If your, if your bond value travels through an experience, whatever, you know, could be could be a cool content, entertaining content, or a cool party that you wish to send to your friend because you're there and you want to you know, look cool, then it's totally in your friend feed. And it's not coming from the brand, it's coming from your friends, and it's in your friend feed, and when you click on it, you open an HTML5 tab and you can have a cool experience. You know, remember about the beginning of Instagram, that's how they get big, right? So I think today, if you focus on the, you know, the, the right things to do on Facebook mobile, because that was your question, you can achieve some excitement by bringing all the cool new things you can do, checking in, geolocalization, friend tagging, photo checking, you know, like all the... Sure, all well, the basic building blocks are there, yeah. but the advanced... The, the problem is, this is something that doesn't give money to Facebook. So they don't want to push it, that's it. Oh, well, they do like to push it because they, they push it to us, and because and, and they get to sell us ads, you know, or sell you know uh, ad units to direct people there. They love that. I think one of the things that Facebook's going to work out as they kind of go into their next phase is really what business they're in, and they're not necessarily. I don't think they necessarily know what business they're in right now. The way that they kind of sell ad spaces in some places, it's about canvas and what you can do in kind of destination spaces in others. But kind of why people got there was about the human interactions and the conversations that you have um, have with those people. And I think Facebook really is in the communications business. And how they kind of take that to the next level in mobile is going to kind of define their success. This is about people having conversations with each other. And whether brands can be part of that or people can kind of bring brands into those conversations. So as Facebook kind of expands and starts to do more investments and kind of more acquisitions, I'd be looking at kind of what new kind of communication habits and they start to create. Um, right now, they're pretty much an asynchronous um, conversation stream. Um, it's not real time. I still text everybody. Chat's kind of hidden away, but that's how people live in mobile. It's in the moment, in that second, and how I kind of have conversations with people. So as soon as they start to kind of push that forward and start to having a better interaction with each other through Facebook, I think some magic's gonna start to happen. And if you look at what kind of, I, the next stage is then how do you like kind of brands and provide new types of services and value inside that conversation. If you look at what's happening with Siri, um, Apple took away most of the good functionality that was in Siri originally, kind of the service-based semantic web um, APIs that other brands could come in and kind of get you those um, flowers for your wife because it's your anniversary or kind of book you that re restaurant right there in line. So Apple took a lot of that stuff out to really understand what types of communications people wanted to have with their device. And then in the next phases, I'm sure that's where they'll open that back up to brands and apps and other services. Services. And Facebook doesn't seem to be really doing that. So I think if they would shift themselves really big, big about in the conversation and relationship business, um, which is where they kind of started to get back into that and then start to let brands in about providing instant, real time, in the moment that's hyper contextual to exactly what you're looking for in that moment, um, they'll start to be more successful. And Apple's going to make a big push um, with Siri to kind of. Um, start bringing those things in. So your communications with each other and your device and other brands is going to be on your terms rather than kind of being the really kind of interstitial, in your face, um, stop you what you are actually trying to do and take you to some other location. So I think deciding what business they're in is going to be what makes Facebook even more successful. Okay, very cool. Thank you, guys. Um, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. and. Um, uh, hi, uh, my name is Rob, and uh, I work at a travel media agency called Travel Media. We do mobile, social, display. So I come from a media. Sorry, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Rob. Um, Rob, travel media. 
Kind of trying to me, yeah. And um, I come from a very quantum media focus. So I'm just kind of curious if you guys can talk a little bit about uh, mobile commerce. So can you talk about what like platforms, technologies are catering to you know driving users to like book a hotel or buy something? Um, I think what's interesting right now is Foursquare Amex deal. You know the check-in, ten dollars off Amex thing. So can you guys talk a little bit more about the things you guys are seeing that are kind of catering to that space? So I think this is an extremely infantile space and, and social, I think that social commerce in general is, is the future of social media itself, but also inside the mobile arena. And we haven't even seen anything yet. Foursquare, the user experience by which you have to check in 10 times or five times and then show a coupon or show the number of check-ins to the service at the customer desk is, is, a, is a very terrible consumer um, process. Um, I don't, know if, I don't know if you want me, I don't know if I'm going to go into what's going to happen, if you want me to, I can touch on that, but just one startup that is kind of making a dent in the space is Local Response. Um, <clears throat> they have an intent-based um, advertising platform that targets consumers based on their intent at check-in, so they're monitoring explicit and implicit checkings. Explicit meaning I just checked in with Foursquare or, or any other um, explicit check-in app, or I just mentioned in a tweet I just arrived at you know, JFK. Um, and then based on the checking, the advertiser will send you, either through an app reply or a direct message, um, a, a response to that. So they've used the platform, for example, I think Verizon's one of their clients, so people are checking in um, to AT&T and are or complaining about AT&T at the moment when the shop is right there they're targeting them with something that is much more enticing and sending them to Verizon um, and they've seen their CTR rate is huge it's 33 percent I think on top of my head so um, happy to make it I don't I'm not on their board but I'm happy to make introductions if anyone wants at the end of this but um, from, from a future perspective, you know, without going into detail and keeping it on a high level, I think the user experience by which we are able to, you know, get rid of the wallet um, and and go through the, the transaction is going to be like like that. Right now, it's pain. I, th I think this year, uh, a few cool things have uh, appeared at a big scale already. If you check out, uh, I suppose you have them already, the Tesco application in UK, the Amazon application in US, um, they allow you to actually physically go to the store or sit at a lunch table and grab a product and you know flash it with image recognition or just you know look at the barcode and purchase it from you know on the spot and then go home and it's free delivery. So this is freaking out many, many of the big clients on the market. Because it means that they have deals with you know, distribution. You know, they have deals with, you know, whatever it's L'Oreal, deal with Sephora and stuff like that. People will actually walk in Sephora and you know, do things and run around and actually enjoy the music and the light and all that is very expensive on Fifth Street. And then they will like, walk out and they did their shopping. But Sephora has one, not, no information about them. You know, because they don't go through the register anymore. And actually, Sephora is wondering why, like, five or ten or way more in the future of their business is, like, evaporating uh, to go to, uh, to, uh, to Amazon until they react and they do the same thing with added value. Stuff. So I think, you know, many, many interesting are, are happening for the end user. You know, what I just described, and also that needs to have the whole strategy for a brand rethink. Because when you are working in marketing, you have brief the talk about target and things like that. So if you have the, the cart of a big family now, you know, part of the cart will be filled by you know, the mom, part of the cart will be filled by the son, and then who's deciding what to remove. So the whole process of grocery shopping is really different. So it's, uh, all of that is super exciting. It's, it's, it's happening right now, and we need to look at it, and we need to understand exactly what matters, what doesn't, you know, not rush and, and react, uh, not in the, in the store, but also in our strategy and yeah, everything. Uh, so just one more thing that's kind of like related to your, to your question. <clears throat> one of the challenges in terms of adoption and, and commerce in the mobile space is, I think, is security. Um, technology companies, software companies, 
um, as well as consumer feeling, feeling comfortable with processing a transaction and knowing that it's safe is, is something that we haven't quite got used to. Um, and I think the template and DNA to fulfill that is still going to come. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, very interesting. I mean, the Sephora example I think is, is pretty compelling. Uh, there's a Sephora a block away and they're probably paying some of the highest retail rent in the world. Um, and it's certainly a disruptive technology that you're describing. Um, any other questions from uh, the audience? All right, I'm going to go in the back here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel there's a bias. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Hey, how's it going? My name is Bargo. So this question's mostly for Damon. Uh, you talked about the future of mobile actually not being mobile anymore, being more embedded. And I was curious as to how you see people adapting that culture of uh, embedding devices within us. Um, because it's one thing to carry around a phone, it's another thing to have it integrated with you as a person. Uh, what path do you see that taking on will be, you know, obviously I think Google Goggles is the next step, but what's after that to, to integrate with us? Slower lines, airport security. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the, 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 the biggest thing that slowed down people to be implanted is they want to travel, and it's, it's actually a, a pure truth. I will say it will be exactly like the TV, exactly like the mobile. You know, you remember when you had a mobile? I, you know, I was in France, and when I took the bus, and my mom will call me on it, and I pick up, I will have people screaming at me, saying, you know, go home to get a phone call. And I think in the beginning we will experience the same. You know, we have the tools, but we don't know how to interact with them, how to be polite, how to you know, deal with the transparency. If you carry like a GPS, like we start to do on certain phone, like when do you turn it off? What is the social convention for that? So we, we, will, we will learn a lot. And um, to be honest, I don't, I don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm certainly willing to uh, participate, jump in and, and discover like I did with the mobile. I think the interesting thing is gonna be kind of where does the, Passover happen, and we, when we think about kind of embedding things into our bodies, that gets a little scary and kind of shocks the conscious, um, conscience. Um, but if you see what's happening with, uh, with what Nike Fuel is doing with embedding in something else, it's the first phase is going to be embedding in other things, um, and then we'll be more accepting to kind of where kind of certain pieces of information and data and um, digital objects start to kind of attach to ourselves, but I think the space to watch right now is in fashion technology. I mean, nobody's really going that hard into it and truly kind of pushing that space that hard because the fashion industry isn't a technology company, well, it's a different kind of technology company, so how those relationships start to come together, and it's about embedding in other objects, whether it be bags, whether it be pockets, whether it be belts, whether it be shoes. Um, and how we start to kind of see that happening will start to indicate where people want um, extra pieces of sensor data information around their body and around their self. I, I think if you push it, and if we can dream two minutes, uh, for example, the Nike team, uh, the handicapped Nike team have been uh, forbidden to participate to Olympic Games with their new uh, <laughs> fake legs because uh, actually they are running faster than humans with it. So the question from the Olympic Committee was, you know, should we allow that? And it, it's a question that we will have everywhere. Like, let's say um, uh, someone lose an arm, you know, and, and get, decide to have like a replacement arm, and this arm, like already existing biotechnology, you can lift like I don't know, 400 pounds and, and work actually better, and you don't need, you don't you don't care about getting burned or anything because your arm is actually metallic. We will start to see discri like positive discrimination, like people that wants to hire those people because they are performing better than regular humans. So this kind of legal slash crazy issue will stand, and ultimately, uh, we will have to decide if we want to die or not. Uh, we have already uh, nanobots and nanotechnology that allow you to do crazy things, like al already existing tests on animal that allow like rats to go underwater for 20 minutes because they have nanobots uh, in the bloodstream and, and things like that. So this is not science fiction, this is existing today. And, and we have this concept of if we can slow down the way we get old and die, we will eventually get into a point where we'll slow down this with nanotechnology um, until we find the solution to not die and then and then and then. So we will have to decide, do we stop doing babies 
or do we stop or do we start dying again? You know, because we cannot be too much here on the planet. So you know so we when David, we you're, you're, you're freaking me out. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how many of you know the concept of singularity. Yes. Uh, so, this con so the people working at the MIT or Harvard about the, the, the singularity say that uh, it's coming. Like we in this room, we are all likely to see, to see the point where uh, like non-human machine will think as much as we do and as good and faster, etc. So what do we do then? You know, so, and, and your first question was 10 years down the road. Well, guess what? That's going to come like 10, 20 years down the road. So how, how are we in this room going to react? You know, the first time your, your HR, like your human resource, will send you an email, they are robots and they fire you because you are too slow, what are you going to do? You know? Is that a riot? Is that a... These, these questions are the real question about the future of mobile. It's not about marketing, like it's changing the way human race is. So the future of mobile is Battlestar Galactica. You, you, you heard it here first. Uh, Paul, Paul, you were going to say something. <laughs> Um, so intense body modification is. <laughs> what what is in that bottle he's drinking? <laughs> so uh, hardcore body modification is is the future of mobile marketing. Um, so any other questions uh, from from the audience? Um, we're gonna break in just a moment and. Um, and uh, have some networking and, and some more drinks. Um, and uh, we appreciate <laughs> we need some more drink. So before we do that, I want to just wrap it up and um, ask uh, again, go, go through each member of the panel and just have some some uh, final thoughts based on what we've touched on today. Um, oh, well, one more question. Oh. I don't know. This might be a little sensitive for this crowd, um, but how do you feel about uh, security? And, and this is more about a social question as much as it is a mobile question. But uh, how do you feel about security and where it's going? And whose responsibility is it to make sure that the the end user, let alone your your clients, understand the limitations of security and, and who's responsible for that? The security, both in the sense of losing your password, but also um, exposing my home address to the world. Right. 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 Sir. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think end users care very much. So, you know, every once in a while people get riled up about what Facebook knows and what they don't know and their information is, you know, stored centrally. But ultimately, people are on it from dawn till dusk and they, don't, they put the most personal things on earth, you know, on Facebook. And if you search for embarrassing topics in Facebook's sort of general search box, you get all kinds of people who are discussing them publicly. I think from a, from a technology and where Facebook or a potential competitor goes in five to ten years, Again, while I don't think anybody gives a crap, uh, there's, there's a seed of an idea in that what if it were some sort of peer-to-peer -peer version of the same system where ultimately your data were stored on your personal mobile device and then transferred from device to device through some sort of you know, uh, nanobot-infested cloud that we breathe into our lungs, Damon. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> I actually sit on the advisory board of a company um, out of San Francisco called Social IQ Networks and they're, they're tackling, or we are tackling this exact problem, except we're starting in the enterprise. So brands are worried about security, whether it's password management um, or people tampering with their accounts um, or not knowing who's an admin anymore. You know, one of our clients, a big field, Samsung, has almost two Two thousand Facebook pages, um, and they don't know who, what's official, what's not official, um, who's got the passwords, who's responsible, um, and so social IQ networks is kind of like this layer that you stick in there and provides. It's 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 taking the naught of the internet security and naught antivirus and and WebSense. I don't know if anyone's familiar with WebSense.com, but they are you know what what happened in the internet world. We needed security. We're going to see the same thing in social, mobile, local, whatever terminology you'd like to use. And the, the danger is really, I think Paul touched on it, is the consumer, because the consumers have no idea. They're just so obsessed with the app store and, and the ability to communicate and, and, and share. And they, they, they have, they're not aware of what is happening to them in terms of personal data and search engines finding X number, you know, <coughs> X, Y, or Z. So 
I'm not, I don't know if the consumers are going to wake up to it, but the brands have woken up to it, and or perhaps are starting to wake up to it. It's our responsibility to care, and it's like a huge problem. Right. But I, I agree. Someone with me. I, I do. <laughs> I do, and I think that's our responsibility, clearly, to your question. Whose responsibility? Everyone. If Dan said nicely, you guys are building the next world. If it may be true, then that's our responsibility to build it. Um, that's again. Really my question is about where does it stop? Because obviously the end user doesn't care as much. Well, is it our responsibility to care for them? You have um, you have people um, uh, doing research on um, cars, for example. You know those cars that become so smart, and the Google car coming up, and things like that. On a very regular car, they were able to drive behind the car that they were targeting and hack the car through Bluetooth and uh, wireless and GPS and whatever technology you know. And they were able to do things like turning light on and off, applying brakes, installing malware on the car that will trigger for like, let's say the car goes over 45 miles per hour, you trigger a malware that says stop the brakes or something like that. So this is happening to a car. We're talking about embedding technologies and human body. You know, many people run around with pacemaker. The same group of research were able to hack a pacemaker you know, so you can actually kill someone with a virus, with an with a electronic virus. So yes, the more we're getting close and the more we embed our data into our environment, and I'm not even talking body, the more we have risk. Imagine if they had some sort of cybernetic endoskeleton. <laughs> yeah, but think about your fridge, think about your phone, think about everything you have around you that is already dangerous, like piloting, you know, like, you know, anyway. <laughs> We're all gonna die! <laughs> okay guys, thank you. I wanna, I wanna wrap it up. Um, I think we all need some drinks. Um, so I just wanna, I just wanna wrap it up by going uh, through the member, uh, through the uh, the panel here. And just some some final thoughts based on the topics we've covered. Um, uh, let's just let's have a ball. Sorry. Uh, some final thoughts. Just, just let's. <laughs> has your perspective changed? Uh, do, do you feel like we're, we're heading towards Armageddon with uh, nano-infested, uh, you know, robots, or does it look like this is actually the beginning of some kind of utopian dream? Like, what, which direction are we heading? Towards? Uh, I think I've incriminated myself a, a bit much by, uh, by speaking too much, but I, I think that we, we, again we're at the very frontier. This is so exciting. Uh, the stuff that we didn't uh, touch on are NFC chips, right? Uh, the ability to, to pay at the cash register with your mobile device. Nobody's cracked that yet, and I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but they've all got it wrong. And somebody's going to get it right, and that's why they're, that's why Visa and Verizon and Amex and, and Apple and Google are all killing themselves to get in that space. And somebody's going to win, and it's going to be a, a, you know, a, a whole new world. With robots, aren't, aren't they using that in Japan though? Uh, right, there's the NFC. Uh, is it Korea? Where you can use the Vendo machines, right, yeah. to, to purchase who knows what. But but again, right now it's all, it's so fragmented, yeah. right? And uh, to to uh, your point earlier, the hardware and the software have to be like inexorably linked, right? Because if, if you've got your NFC chip running and it's running through an app, well, I don't want to have to go start up my app every time I wander into the 7-Eleven to buy a Slurpee. I want to just wave my phone. It's got to be easier than my right. stupid plastic card. And my stupid plastic card is really freaking easy. You shouldn't have to do anything. Right. Okay. So uh, that's it. OK, Richard, any parting thoughts? Um, I, I spent actually most of my career inside Motorola um, designing cell phones and kind of getting really deep on the embedded software. You, you were on the, the Razer team, weren't you? I was on a bunch of things. Um, Razer I was late to, but... Um, I bet most of the people in this room have owned a phone that Richard was involved in. So. And a lot of work with um, kind of remote um, emerging markets, so how do you kind of take technology down to kind of the lowest um, price point, um, which was super exciting, which we kind of talk about all this high technology. Um, how do we kind of start looking at kind of a wider audience and kind of rich New Yorkers who can afford a $300 iPhone? I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there and kind of spending as much time kind of um, at the kind of lower price point, more engaged, kind of wider audience is going to be really interesting, and that's where things are going to um, start to change as well. Rather than just kind of high-end smartphones, let's think about what's next to bring everybody else along. I think, but one of the things I've noticed, kind of 
I spent a long time inside Motorola and then moved late to kind of the marketing and advertising world. Um, those two worlds never talk to each other. Yes, Samsung will hire a marketing agency to market the phones, but how do brands and market marketers actually start to kind of work with the technology companies making the devices? Because until those things start to happen, you won't get the magical um, NFC check-in because everything's been built from here's a software OS platform, here's some hardware, and then everybody else come to the game late and try and work within these constraints. When those um, worlds start coming together, looking at human behavior together and creating hardware, software, and kind of the enhancements on top of that, then some true magic will happen. Verizon kicked Google Wallet off of their phones uh, last December or November. That's it, because they're competing, they're competing service, which like, you know knows how Apple's gonna do, but they were poised to make a play. So, and I think they've got my oh, exactly. So they own every piece of the puzzle. So that contained ecosystem is, uh, is a blessing and a curse, I guess. I mean, it limits, you know, the, the progression of technology, some may say, but um, yeah, in terms of things actually working, it works. And I think consumers want things to work. So, um, Mikael, uh, party yes. thoughts. So, Parting thoughts. We haven't really touched on this in detail, but I think um, you know Reid Hoffman said Web three is going to be data, and um, I think the future or an aspect of the future of mobile or mobile and marketing is data. And um, right now, various software companies and hardware companies are accumulating so much data. I think the human society and the human race, as well as brands have not really worked out how to harness the power of data. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but I think it was in the 70s when the US, I'm not from America, but I think it was the US Department of Homeland Security had, they were running computers when computers went to sleep, when you went to sleep at night, they were using the processes of, processes of your computer. Remember the name of this? SATI, which stands for? Yeah, search for yeah, the search for yes, thank you. I forgot, search for extraterrestrial um, intelligence. They were using everyone else's computers and sucking in data and trying to like search for this. And this, this. <laughs> Paul was their biggest. Uh, so can you artist. imagine if we did the same thing with, with all the data that's happening right now in mobile and social? And, um, you know, if we took Zynga data and, and Facebook data and Pinterest data and check-in data and, and advertising data and banner data and, and search data, and we were able to, to kind of harness that and use it to solve real-world problems, whether it's, you know, using Zynga to, to, to solve poverty and, or, or, or farming problems where there's, there's drought in Southern Africa or something like that. Um, or, or perhaps even for, for marketers and brands to leverage that data. But uh, I, I don't think everyone, anyone's got, well, Perhaps some scientist somewhere in, in some college room is working on this, but there is definitely an opportunity to leverage the power of data for human society and marketing. Okay, very interesting. This seems to be a convergence of big, uh, big data and and, uh, and so uh, Ryan. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm kind of scared of the future. Um, I just keep seeing Terminator. You know, um, <laughs> the Cylons are coming. No, it's, it's interesting to, to think about where humans fit in with technology. You know, we keep talking about technology, technology. Um, is it going to surpass us? Are we going to be bots and brains? And uh, there's also the visual of uh, Super Ninja Turtles, the brain. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, no, I think that uh, you know, how do we visualize this data? How do we interact with all this data that we're going to be integrating? Is going to be kind of interesting. Um, you know, something I'm interested in is uh, you know UI systems. Um, you know, are we going to have Google Glasses? I mean, I don't see anything wrong with glasses. Most of us have glasses. <laughs> three, three out of five. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, we laugh about glasses, but um, you know, maybe it'll be a contact, or, or who knows what it's going to be. But it, I think if the if the use of the technology is beneficial, then it doesn't really matter what form it is. At some point, we will adopt it. I mean, computers were the size of buildings at one point. Um, yeah, they become smaller and smaller and smaller, and you know, we find uses for them. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Okay, interesting. Uh, an art director's perspective on the user experience of, of uh, big data. Damon, uh, parting thoughts. I, I, I look at the name and it's called the future of mobile marketing. <laughs> so, Did you make fun of my, of my title one more time? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, for once, no. If you are a marketer and you want to perform in mobile marketing, stop thinking about the mobile. Don't do the same mistake that 
our predecessor have done when the web came in, focusing on the web as a technology in a separate channel, kill the silo thinking from scratch, and think about consumer experience, brand stories, and, and what actually people want to hear. They don't care about Facebook, they don't care about their mobiles, they care about their friends, and they care about the brand they love and they like to use. So stop thinking about mobiles as the best way to perform in mobile. Okay, thank you, Dorothea. Um, and thank you everybody for coming out.